Let's pray together as we come to God's word now. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you have not left us alone. We thank you that by your spirit in Jesus Christ, you walk with us day by day. And we thank you that you have given us your word in the scriptures. We pray, Father, that by your spirit now, you would walk with us as we come to these, your words. Would you open our eyes and soften our hearts that we might hear what you have to say to us and that we might apply it to our lives so that we may live lives that please you, so that we may walk in step with your spirit and so that we may glorify Jesus Christ until the day he comes again. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name's uh, Rue. I'm one of the the ministers here. And we're going to be continuing this morning in our series in the book of Jeremiah. And we're going to hear readings from various parts of the book uh, today. But if you've uh, got a Bible with you on your phone or on your laptop or uh, maybe even an old-fashioned print version, um, then turn now, if you would, to Jeremiah 49. We'll be starting there in a few minutes' time. So have that ready for when we come to it. Well, some years ago, uh, my wife and I were visiting another church, and the service included a time for prayer about things going on in the world at that moment. The lady leading us got to a section where we were praying for the people of a war-torn, disputed territory. She prayed with passion and compassion for these suffering people asking our God to relieve their suffering, to bring justice to their situation. Then, as she drew to a close, she spoke these words. And Lord, for these people, above all, we ask. Now I wonder... How would you finish that sentence? How would you complete that prayer? As we look at the world around us, as we wrestle with the the suffering and sadness that we see, what is it above all that we long to see? Well, as we come to the final chapters of the book of Jeremiah, our eyes are lifted from the plight of the people of Judah, the remains of the, the kingdom of Israel, Our eyes are lifted to see the surrounding nations, to consider the whole world. And whilst in our Bibles today, Jeremiah's words about the nations are gathered together at the end of the book. When they were first spoken, they were scattered through his life and ministry. As the Lord spoke through Jeremiah to Judah, so he also spoke of his plans for the wider world. Remember, way back in chapter 1, that was Jeremiah's commission. The Lord said, See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Yahweh, the, the God of Israel, has always been the God of the whole world. And so his concern for justice and righteousness has always extended beyond the borders of ancient Israel. And so too has his mercy and grace. It is not only the people of Judah who will know salvation through judgment. That is the way of our God in all the world. Now, there are in all eight prophecies here concerning the surrounding nations. We'll look at at some of Jeremiah's words for Babylon next week. But we don't have time to read all of the other seven this morning. Instead, to give you a, a flavor of what the Lord says in these chapters, Colin's going to read now just one of those prophecies. The Lord's word to the nation of Elam. In chapter 49, beginning at verse 34. 
This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty says. See, I will break the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. I will bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. I will scatter them to the four winds, and there will, be, and there will not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. I will shatter Elam before their foes, before those who want to kill them. I will bring disaster on them. Even my fierce anger declares the Lord. I will pursue them with the sword until I have made an end of them. I will set my throne in Elam and destroy her king and officials, declares the Lord. Yet I will restore the fortunes of Elam in days to come, declares the Lord. Now there is perhaps something reassuringly familiar about those words. They sound very much like the words we've read over the last few weeks, don't they? The words the Lord spoke to his people, Judah. Here to Elam, Yahweh speaks words of judgment, words of righteous anger and certain destruction. You see, Elam, just like Judah, had refused to listen to the true and living God. They had ignored his ways, replaced him with worthless idols, and perpetuated evil and injustice in their land. Indeed, all of the the prophecies that we find here against the nations speak of the Lord's coming judgment. We are told that, that God will bring punishment on Egypt, her gods and her kings, and those who rely on Pharaoh. The Lord is about to destroy the Philistines. Moab will be destroyed as a nation because she defied the Lord. When he sounds the battle cry against Rabbah of the Ammonites, it will become a mound of ruins. Edom will become an object of horror. The Lord will set fire to the walls of Damascus. And Kedar and Hazor, he will bring disaster on them from every side. These chapters make for sobering reading. But I think there's also something reassuring. Our God is utterly consistent. His rule, his sovereignty does not stop at the borders of ancient Israel. Neither geography nor time will restrict his mighty arm. He will see justice done and righteousness will prevail in all the earth. Even the great powers of this world must one day bow the knee to the true and living God. It's worth noting, isn't it, that that these empires listed here are no longer the movers and shakers of this world. Just as the Lord promised, these nations and kingdoms have been uprooted and torn down, destroyed and overthrown. But there's something else here as well. I wonder if you noticed it. It happens time and time again through these chapters, like a parting of the clouds, a ray of light amidst the gloom of impending judgment. Let's look again at verse 39. Yet I will restore the fortunes of Elam in days to come, declares the Lord. You see, not only is God's justice and his righteousness consistent across all time and in all places, but so is his commitment to mercy, to grace, to salvation. Just as judgment will come upon the nation, so salvation will come through judgment. Egypt will be inhabited as in times past. The Lord will restore the fortunes of Moab and the Ammonites and here Elam. 
Yes, it was ancient Israel that Yahweh chose to be his people, but always with the intention of using them to bless the whole world. Always with the intention of grafting in those from every tribe and tongue and nation, grafting them in to the people of God. Our sovereign God, the only true and living God, is God of the whole world. And it is his delight to bring salvation through judgment to the nations of the world. You know, there's a, a beautiful fulfillment of these words in Jeremiah 49 on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the fledgling church in Jerusalem and 3,000 were added to their number. There, in that crowd... We read in Acts chapter 2, were, amongst others, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. Elamites from the land of Elam. There, as the new covenant promised back in Jeremiah 31, secured through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, as the new covenant was sealed by the coming of the Holy Spirit, right there, in amongst those being baptized that day, were Elamites. I will restore the fortunes of Elam, the Lord had promised. And restore them he did. And it's important here as we consider the, the bringing in of the nations to God's plans that we remember that the fulfillment of these promises doesn't just happen at the level of nations and people groups. The Lord in his sovereignty brings in individuals, real people with real lives. Indeed, you and, and I are part of that fulfillment of this promise to bring salvation to the nations. We are those who have been grafted into the people of the new covenant. But just to help us see that this individual personal salvation has always been part of God's plans for the nations, I want to take us back to an incident that we skipped over earlier in the book of Jeremiah. A beautiful example of the Lord's work in the life of one individual. The events in question took place at, at around about the same time as Jeremiah first spoke these words against Elam. But they concern a foreigner from a different land, the land of Cush. We join the action back in Jerusalem after the Babylonians have first attacked and defeated Judah. There, Jeremiah continued to advise the people to submit to the Lord's judgment by submitting to the Babylonians. But the new king, Zedekiah, had in mind to rebel, to rise up and, and challenge Babylon. His nobles, keen to curry favor with the king, hatched a plan to get the pesky prophet Jeremiah out of the way. They picked him up and threw him into an empty cistern, a muddy and unpleasant well too deep for Jeremiah to climb out. And that might well have been the end of the Lord's man and his ministry, had it not been for the intervention of a certain Ebed Melech, a man from Cush. Colin's going to read for us now from Jeremiah chapter 38, beginning at verse 7. But Ebed Melech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Ebed Melech went out to the palace and said to him, My lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Cushite, 
Take 30 men from here with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Ebed-Melech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, Put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so, and they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. Surrounded by his own countrymen who won't listen to him, Jeremiah was rescued by a foreigner. To approach the king in in those days was a dangerous thing, but Ebed-Melech stood up for justice and righteousness, even though it could have cost him his life. He was compassionate and kind to Jeremiah, even in the midst of a hostile environment. But whilst his outward actions are heroic, what really interests us today is Ebed-Melech's heart. Let's listen to how the story ends as Colin reads from chapter 39, starting at verse 15. While Jeremiah had been confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him. Go and tell Ebed-Melech the Cushite, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I am about to fulfill my words against this city, words concerning disaster, not prosperity. At that time, they will be fulfilled before your eyes. But I will rescue you on that day, declares the Lord. You will not be given into the hands of those you fear. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape with your life because you trusted in me, declares the Lord. Don't miss how stunning this is. Remember the shape of Jeremiah's ministry. For more than 30 years, he had proclaimed the message of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And for more than 30 years, He had been ignored, dismissed, called a liar or a traitor, threatened and marginalized. The one constant through the book of Jeremiah is that no one listens to Jeremiah. No one, that is, except Ebed-Melech. And who is Ebed-Melech? A priest? No. A leader? No. He's not even an Israelite. Almost every time he's mentioned, we're reminded that he's a Cushite, a foreigner. The narrator is trying to drive it home. When the king and his nobles and all the people of Judah couldn't care less what God's prophet had to say, there is one faithful believer, one believer who values the life of God's prophet, one believer who will do the right thing, one believer who trusts in Yahweh. Yahweh, the God, not just of ancient Israel, but of the whole world. And just in passing, I think there's a tendency for some in the West today to imagine the world of the Bible as being populated by white Europeans. But friends, that has far more to do with Renaissance paintings and Hollywood movies than it has to do with the actual text of Scripture. You see, Kush is south of Egypt, modern-day Sudan. Ebed-Melech was a black African welcomed into the family of God long before the gospel came to Europe. 
welcomed into a family that has always been multi-ethnic. A family that has always been intended for those of every tribe and tongue and nation. And right now, Ebed-Melech stands amongst the great multitude in heaven, gathered around the throne of the Lamb, praising him in every language known to man, a beautifully diverse family, united in their love for Yahweh, drawn together by the saving work of Jesus Christ. Friends, the salvation offered in these pages is available to everyone who will put their trust in him. He is the great hope of the nations. And so how then should we pray for the nations of the world? And Lord, for for these people, above all, we ask... Well, on that day a few years ago, that sentence was finished with these words. For these people, above all, we ask that they would be recognized by the UN. It's not a bad prayer. Undoubtedly, much of the the suffering and injustice in that region would be eased by international recognition by the power structures of our day stepping in. But friends, I think if that is the best we can hope for, if all we can desire for those in need is that our current earthly institutions pay attention to them, then are we not in danger of falling into exactly the same falsehood that gripped those left behind in Jerusalem all those centuries ago? They longed for the safety and security of ancient Egypt to be under the protection of one of the great powers of the day, to know the reassurance of money and power and comfort. But what they really needed was the God who builds and plants such nations, the God who uproots and tears them down, The God who exercises judgment and the God who brings salvation. Friends, it is tempting for us today to think that a small change in our circumstances will bring the relief that we long for. Maybe this president or that one. Perhaps this international union, or that one. If only we had a vaccine. If only electric cars were cheaper. If only we had more money, or power, or influence. These aren't bad things. It's not wrong to desire them for ourselves, or for others who are in need. Indeed, it was precisely a lack of compassion for the poor, a lack of concern over injustice that marked out the kingdom of Judah for God's judgment, that showed that they had strayed far from his words and his ways. But what Ebed-Melech knew, what Jeremiah pleaded for, what those Elamites at Pentecost experienced is that our greatest necessity, our highest need, is the salvation of the Lord our God. A salvation that, that comes through his good and right justice poured out onto his son, Jesus Christ so that we might be reconciled, so that we might know God, so that we might be brought into the family. And so let's pray for freedom from poverty, 
for food and water for all the nations, for peace and prosperity. Let's pray for international cooperation, for good governance, for fair distribution of resources. Let's pray for an end to COVID and relief from suffering. But Lord, for these people, for all people, for ourselves, above all, we ask that we might trust in you. That we might listen to the true and living God. And that we might come to you in humility. Cast ourselves on your mercy. And experience your salvation in Jesus Christ. The hope of the nations. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we look at your world, we see so much need, so much injustice, so much that is evil. Lord, we cry out for your mercy. We ask that you would come, that you would act in justice and goodness and love. Lord, for those who are suffering, we pray that you might bring relief. For those in need, we pray that you might bring provision. For our whole world, we pray that you would bring justice. And yet, Lord, above all, we pray that you would bring salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Might the nations stream to him, the peoples of your world come to him in trust and faith. Might we be united with people from every tribe and tongue and nation, united by your spirit, binding us together to your Son, Jesus Christ. In whose name and for whose glory we pray all of these things. Amen.